another podcast. People actually seem to like these things. Isn't it kind of crazy? I get reports, uh, podcast like ranking reports. We've got people in Ireland. I've seen uh, Australia, United States, Canada. Um, those are kind of the biggest four. So you're pretty popular in Ireland. Must be like the red hair. It could be uh, the Conan O'Brien ginger thing going yeah. on. They might be thinking that I'm Conan O'Brien. But yeah, I, then obviously our, our podcast that went all over the world quite literally um, with uh, Craig Lewis and Jason Fisher, that probably helped out a little bit with some of those people that maybe aren't uh, local to the Great Lakes region or what have you. But uh, we'll, we'll leave that alone. But go check that out. That was a pretty good one. Um, but we got a little – we're switching gears totally. We've got Tom Keenan who – he is not afraid to talk, that is for sure. Me and him going at each other for 20-some years. But um, long story short, he's one of the all-time money winners, depending on who you talk to, top couple, if not the. And uh, What does that really mean? What does that know. mean, whoever you talk to? Well, here's the deal. It's kind of like with TV shows, right? You remember me and you, we did a TV show. So when you talk, if you know about TV, there's like five people that all claim they have the number one ranked fishing I TV know. show. Okay. And it's like, well, how is, isn't, there's got to be one of the is or isn't, right? So it's like that with these deals because what they count or they don't count. But long and the short, Tom has won a lot of money walleye fishing. Uh, and he is a interesting character who never stops talking like me. And me and him, I like to go at each other. So long story short, let's just bring him in before he, uh, you know, changes his mind maybe. <laughs> Welcome to the Big Water Podcast, Tom Keenan. A little bit of technical difficulties, but here we are. It was a struggle, but we're here. Yeah. Do you think if we if we started your career over with all the technology, do you think you could do it? Oof. I'd have to get my daughters to help me for sure. Yeah, we got Mega Live now, and we had flashers when you were doing it at the beginning, right? But Amen. I, I, I just want to I just want to set the tone here because obviously you're a great fisherman. Everybody knows that. But I Googled you. And I've known you for like 20, roughly 20 years, but I Googled you and there's some actor that's apparently comes up when you put Tom Keenan. Cause I was going to, I was you know, looking into things a little bit. Yeah. So you I'm got, just it's, saying it's Tom Keenan fisherman, not Tom Keenan actor. But if you look up Ross Roberts and I'm just saying that, that we don't have that issue, but yeah, nevertheless, not yeah. much ample there. Hey Ross, there actually is, I believe he's like a British rugby player or something. Oh, <laughs> Oh, he's, not, he's uh, not above us. He's not New above Zealand us. or something like that. No, he is not above you, of course. Thanks, thanks to producer, dude. He's not above us. But at any rate, so I don't even know. You know, we, me and you have fished together quite a few times through the years and against each other and throwing, having a couple old fashions together and the whole deal. I mean, did you ever think that we'd be sitting here? Or do you think that you'd be sitting here if there was somebody else talking uh, in my place? I don't know. I, you know, I've obviously done it a long time and it's fun to talk to different people. And obviously you went a different way and I went a different way. And uh, it looks like it worked out both for all of us. Yeah. The fishing industry is a, it's a big place and there's a lot of different avenues. And uh, I, I don't even think, do you think that if you, again, joke, not even joking around, if you were to start over right now and you were 20 years younger or something with the way that the tournaments currently are set up, would you still be involved in that? I think so. You know, it was always a dream of mine to do it. And, you know, uh, since I was a young kid and I wanted to do it, but uh, would I like to go back and start over now? Yeah, with what I know, but you know, obviously so much technology has changed, but do I miss it right now? I don't. You know, I've had, I've had a lot of fun the last few years just fishing for fun. And my wife and I fish a lot together now and my uh, mom and dad, my kids and stuff. And I've really enjoyed to get back to that side of fishing. Well, I think that, uh, a lot of our mutual friends, you know, everybody's getting a little older and they always say I'm not as mad at the fish or, you know, going out in six foot waves when it's, you know, 30 degrees out and, you know, you can do it on your time and things a little bit better. But so take us back a little bit. I mean, you started fishing MWCs way back in the day and that was kind of the early bug on this whole deal, right? Yep. I, I fished my first term in 1989. I was a college kid. It was on Little Bitty Knock. My brother and I took second place in the MWC tournament and uh, it kind of got the bug in me and, um, 30 years later, I was still doing it. It was just crazy how it all evolved over that time. I mean, to do anything that long and obviously the time away from your family and the money and all that stuff, do you think if it wouldn't have been or is it fair to say some of those early for people that don't know your career, like some of the RCLs or um, FLWs or whatever that was back then? I know it was RCL at the beginning, but I mean, those were some big money. Those were like bass type paychecks. 
And you guys, I don't want to say lucky, but you got to be honest, there's a little bit of luck that you were kind of on some home waters on some of those early. Like, I mean, how much money did, were on those some of those early? I mean, early? if you had all the qualifying, you could actually uh, win $400,000. Uh, in the first four, f- first five FLWs, I actually led three of them at one time. The first five FLWs ever made a championship, I actually led three of the five. And I got lucky and won one, came close in a couple others, but. Uh, the money was astonishing, you know, to win $300,000 in a tournament was just life changing for me. And uh, based on what I do in my career of working retail, it made my wife and I's life change quick and fast. And so people that maybe don't know back in the day, RCL stood for Ranger Crestliner Lund. And these tournaments were trying to sell boats. And I, I definitely think they did that and, and still are maybe not that same rate or level. But and then that kind of is it fair to say rolled into what is was FLW for a long time and now is major league fishing kind of, um, you know, thing. obviously a lot of faces and things have changed. But those big money things, I mean, that brought a lot of people into it. You know, tournament fishing, that was my question for you. I know you're competitive and doing things, but if those tournaments were for 40 grand and not 400,000, you know, a lot of people hear, oh, 40 grand, that's, and that is a lot of money. But when you start backing out, you know, all the expenses and the time and all of a sudden 40 grand is not 40 grand, right? I agree. And that, that's part of the reason why, you know, walleye fishing today right now from what it was to what it's, it is now, it's changed. It's not, it's, it's a lot easier to fish a tournament. I think it could change your life, but to just go win a tournament, you know, when you make X amount of dollars, the excitement's gone a little bit. And that was one of the reasons why I decided you know, 19, it was time for me to do something different and um, back off a little bit and try to enjoy life more. And I, and I've done that the last three years now or four years, I think it's been now. It's, it's been great. So, I mean, I'm not trying to pin these organizations against each other because obviously they don't all exist anymore, but like the PWT days to me, aside from obviously they weren't the big money deal that brought people in, right? People come where there, where there's money, right? Like that's just a reality. I don't care what you're talking about. But like with the PWT, you remember when you had to have a resume, you know, like Al and Ron kind of had to give the blessing and they had, you know, they, they ran that more like a business for the fishermen also, where FLW is kind of just like, or RCL is just, hey, big, big paychecks. We're going to throw a bunch of money and get a bunch of hype going on this. And, and obviously that was very successful. But what was the difference for you fishing PWT versus whether it's RCL or FLW to... I only fished four, four PWTs in my life, and I fished them all in the 90s, and everyone was on Lake Winnebago. And I, at the time, <laughs> I, at the time, I was fishing a lot of um, MWCs. My brother, my brother, and I fished M, every single MWC for nine years in a row. And my career and my job knowledge hadn't got me to a position in life where I could get away that much. And I didn't become a store manager until 2003, so it was hard for me to tell my boss, "Hey, I want to become a store manager," but I also want to be gone a lot. So I kind of had to wait for all that to play out with my retail career before I could start getting serious about fishing. And that happened in, you know, obviously 2003. So do you think that one helped the other? Or do you think you could have done what you did with having a quote unquote real job, if you will? Um, maybe, but I've always been very conservative and uh, in all my life and all my approach in life, I've been a pretty conservative person. And what I always thought to myself, even if I have a bad tournament, I still got paid. At the end, you know, Gander was very supportive of me. And uh, even if I had a bad term, I was supportive by my wife and I supported financially. So even if I had a bad year of fishing, I still made a lot of money because I had a job. And uh, it was just hard, you know, because pr- prior to a tournament, I fish, I work nine days in a row. I go fish a tournament for seven days. Then I come back and I work nine days in a row. So that was hard. So it'd be a 25 day stretch where I really didn't have a day off for my wife and my kids. And very challenging, very challenging oh. life. And, um, it was a, you know, retail was a very fast paced environment. You worked a lot, but also did I enjoy it? I really did. I wanted to dominate in retail just the way I wanted to dominate in fishing. And uh, that's what drove me to get up every day early and go to work. And uh, would I do things differently now? I probably would. I would probably do some things differently, but you know, life's too short to worry about what you should have done. You need to watch you go forward. And uh, you know, right now I'm in a position in my life where I don't work as hard as I used to. I work for a great career right now and uh, really enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah, I guess not. Not, you know, we're not looking at it from a regret standpoint, but just more of like, you're a competitive guy. You want to excel at everything you do. Obviously, I, I know that well personally. But when you look at it from the standpoint of more of like, you kind of go where the money's at a little bit because you got to be able to keep going, right? Yeah, then that was easy when you went to FLW. There was no ifs, ands, or buts that we were fishing the right tournaments because if you won one of those tournaments, A, you got marketed hard via TV, but also you got a big paycheck. 
and FLW was putting a lot of money towards it. So if you were successful, you could use that to leverage some of your sponsors too, which worked out really good for me. Me being a retail manager, I could also use that leverage. Hey, Rapala, hey, I'm working in a, the biggest box scanner store we got in the world right now. I'm part of the buying team. Will this help me with signing my promotion? You and I always use that leverage very hard as a different angle. So, you know, I mean, you have to in fishing kind of chase the money a little bit, right? Because it's generally speaking over the entire career, like these are not, people may see, like I said, I don't know how to say this in a different way, but people see it what is a big number if that's maybe your salary, but that's not what you're making because you've got all these expenses and the travel and the fuel. Like, I don't think a lot of people, even me in a guide trip, people look at them like, well, how much, uh, like, how much do you burn in the day in gas? And it's like, well, my truck gets about 10 miles a gallon, right? My boat gets two or three, depending on how rough it is. And, and we burn a lot and you've got bait. Uh, back in the day, we had oil, crankbaits. I mean, how many times have you cleared pegs on crankbaits? You know, that are they used to be five, four or five bucks. Now they're eight or nine. And I don't think people realize that, you know, to make it in the fishing industry for a while, you, you kind of have to go with those avenues where you can make money to basically weather the storm, right? I, I agree. And that was an avenue I always took all my life. Was my, I always told my boss my job was number one priority. And if they thought I shouldn't be fishing, I wouldn't be fishing. And I, I had a very good boss, and I had that conversation openly with them. And um, there was a lot of expenses. You know, where you made all the money fishing was, if you had a good fishing year, hopefully you made some money, but sponsorships where you made all the money. And, you know, I always went on that angle, and that's where all my angle came from. And uh, anything I made fishing was was a bonus is the way I looked at it. So That's the gravy. That's that the was gravy. where the money was. That's exactly it. That was your yearly bonus. If you did go in a tournament, that was your yearly bonus. But I could do it. You know, if I had a bad year, I could at least break even. Because I refuse to work hard for five straight weeks at something and not make money. There's just no way that was going to happen, who I am. Well, and, and again, when, when you say that, I, there's so many like things you have to kind of clarify. You know what I mean? Because people that maybe listen to this that, that don't do that or haven't been around that, it's like, well, neither one of us are money chasers per se, because we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. This is Amen. a passion deal, but you, Amen. you might as well make some money while you're doing it. Uh, Amen. If you don't, you know, you're not going to be around very long, but. I just, I was always curious because I've, as long as I've known you, I've never asked you about, you know, obviously you stuck primarily with the FLW because your brands aligned with that at the time. And yep. that was a big thing that people maybe, you know, maybe you could explain that a little bit about how that worked with some of the contingencies and things. So, you know, yep. I may not make as much because I'm not with the right people, but you aligned yourself with the right people. A, a prime example was in 2003, I won an FLW championship in Red Bay, Minnesota. So for winning, you got $150,000. If you had a Ranger boat, you got $150,000. If you had an Evernude motor, you got $100,000. And I did not have an Evernude uh, motor on my boat when I won a championship. It cost me $100,000. And at that time, after winning an FLW championship in 2003, I decided that I was going to start fishing full time. Needless to say, I wouldn't got an Evernude. I, you know, I, I signed a contract with Evernude just because, A, Wisconsin-based company, which I was from, like Mercury was, so you know the two biggest players were actually were in my home state. But B, the incentive money was lucrative. I mean, so even if you did bad in a term, you still got five thousand dollar bonus or two thousand dollar bonuses at the end of the year after a ten year career. That equaled a lot, a lot of money, lots. And, and that stuff, for the most part, is really not there anymore. I see that stuff starting to come back. I coasted all my sunglasses, for example, yeah. starting to have some type of bonus thing. But again, there's certainly not those those early year things. And I don't know if we'll ever see that again, because that was really the early cusp. Again, I, I would argue that the PWT kind of started that and then FLW and RCL jumped in there and took it to a new level for a number of years there. Is that fair? I, I would agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. I, I don't think, I don't know. It's, it's good competition. I, people always are trying to pin these different organizations against each other, even though, you know, most of them really don't even exist anymore. If they do, it's um, very different. Right. But yep. You almost have to have the one to have the other. Just like like you said, Evernood, Mercury, uh, you need the competition. It's actually healthy for everybody. Amen. Amen. So, I, and again, another question I've never asked you or just kind of philosophy is, is you fished a lot of places, but when you go to Devil's Lake for the fourth or fifth time, that's a big advantage. Just like a Kevin Van Dam or something on the Bass Tour. When he's been to Sam Rayburn, when it's muddy water, clean water, high water, low water, fall, spring, like that's a huge advantage. But where did you kind of start to pick up on some of these patterns or take something that you learned on Oahe or Green Bay and move it to Erie or vice versa? I mean, tell me about some of those patterns and things that, you know, are kind of your deal. 
I, I think that, I think one thing I did very well, and I love to do it if I could do it. So I love to pull lead cord and, and braid. I was I was good at it. I enjoyed it. It was an aggressive approach to fishing, and um, I could take it to Green Bay. I could take it to the Mississippi River. I could take it to the Illinois River. As long as it was something where we were making contact in river bottom, it was very easy to do. And um, I got really good at it. I had things figured out in my head that, hey, it took 43 feet of line with this bay at three miles an hour to make it do what I wanted to do. And I learned that. At a, uh, and uh, I took it and took it further and further and further. And I had, I won a championship at, or I won an FLW at Spring Valley. I won an FLW at uh, Rubbing, Minnesota. Then we went down river 500 miles to the Quad Cities the next year in a championship. And I led that championship using the same pattern. It was the exact same thing, fishing the exact same inside at wing dams. It was, but it was just four or 500 yards down river is where we caught them. It was crazy how certain things would work. And um, you could take it further. And the last tournament I fished in my life was on Devil's Lake, North Dakota, uh, fall of 2019. And I took fifth place. I won angle ear. And I caught them in the exact same pattern that I did, you know, 18, 20 years earlier, pulling braid and pulling lead core. Again, if you were looking forward for five years, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but do you see that kind of changing? Because as a good example would be guys are, you know, casting jig and rappelas and things like that at Devil's Lake now. And I know tournaments, obviously, probably that you've even fished have been one doing that or, or guys that are, are consistent producers. Um, so do you think that we're kind of at that point where things are just chasing like mega live coming about, like all these different things that are making it easier to cast? Cause obviously me and you have made a lot of money trolling. It's kind of what you can do to cover water. And it's a good way to learn stuff more, run more than one line. And, and I think you and I had an advantage, you know, obviously 25 years ago trolling, but you know, everyone's caught up with us now that technology and everyone knows it. So I think the guys that I call it sniping them. So the guy that can drop a mega live now or whatever they may use it and actually physically see a fish and snipe them has a big advantage. And, you know, you think about it, we're still in the very early stages of that technology. Where is that technology going to be two years, four years, eight years, ten years now? I don't even know, but it's insanity. It's just insanity how good it is. But like I say, we're in the infant stage. Just give them two years and five years and ten years to improve stuff. And oh, my. Oh my, so I'm going to say, yes. I, think, I think them young kids that like the Bass Masters now have figured that out too, that they're really good with technology. You watch some of the youngest kids right now, they're good. They're playing video games and they're really good at it. And they've learned the technology and they're adapted and, uh, you know, more power to them, more power to them. It's almost like a more refined version of what some of those old farts, I'll call them that, did, you know, when they were back trolling and they were individually rigging, even though it was much more crude, right, electronics. But they would see a fish on their electronics yep. and they yep. would they would try to hover right on that fish and catch them yep. and, and spend time. And this is just, you know, Mega Live is just on steroids compared to what that the is. Old, the, old, the old godfather, Pete Harsh, gave me one of the biggest beatings I've seen in my life one time. And that's what he was doing. <laughs> He beat me like, and I was a young kid. I didn't know what to do, and he beat me so bad. And that's what he was doing. He was a, he was ahead of his time watching it and individually targeting fish, and uh, it was impressive what he did to me. He beat me hard. And uh, at the end of the term, I walked up, and I said, I don't know what you did, sir, but, wow, did you put a beat down on him? And it was crazy. I was a long time. I was probably my early 20s, and he gave me a beating. It was good. What uh, what lake was that at? Saginaw Bay. Saginaw Bay. Was... I watched him pull a bottom bouncer over a rock pile. And he was hovering and he was murdering them, just absolutely murdering them. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was throwing hot and tots over this rock pile. I'm watching him target break lines and individual fish and murdering them. So pretty good. I learned a lot that day. It was a very humble experience, but I learned a lot. So hmm, That was probably before old Johnny Gilman's tournament time maybe then. That's probably, uh, that's probably 93, 94. So that's probably about right, yeah. But when he's getting ready to come on the stage, yep. So how much do you think that, you know, you, you, when I say you guys, like you traveled with guys, obviously, throughout your career, whether it's camaraderie, lodging and all that stuff. But early on, I mean, you guys were team fishing. I don't even know who all at the very beginning, but I guess Pat, uh, Pat and I, you had Dean Arnoldson, yourself, like there was a handful of guys there. And how how advantageous is that? Because that's kind of a big buzzword, even with bass guys are starting to do that now, which that was, as you know, with a lot of the manufacturers we work with, they hated that there was team fishing going on. And they said the bass guys don't do that. Now the bass guys are starting to do that. But how advantageous was that for you uh, working with a team like that? I, I think it was I think it was a big advantage, you know, but I think the whole key was having some people you could trust and that you're friends. And we had that. Um, obviously, when before GPS came out, 
And before all this technology came out, we had to break down the Bay of Green Bay by some pretty old school technology. We could get a GPS coordinate, but we didn't have mapping. And that was a very hard thing to do to break down a huge body of water. A lot of people hadn't fished Green Bay much, for example. And to break that down in segments where, hey, I might take this segment, Ross might take this segment, my brother Mark might take this segment, it helped immensely to start learning big bodies of water. As I got further along, like you said, we started doing, I call them rinse and repeat. As we started going to Devil's Lake for the fifth time or Green Bay for the 12th time, it got easier. We didn't need it quite as much. But when you go to a new body of water I've never been to before, it did help to try to break it down faster and faster. Because me, personally, I'd always have a job, so I'd usually get four and a half days of pre-fish. So I'd roll into Lake Oahe, never been there before. I'd get there on a whatever, and I'd have four and a half days to figure it out. And um, it helped me a lot. Some people would get there weeks in advance. That wasn't me. Well, even even on a place like, let's say, like Green Bay or Lake Erie that you know and fished 100 times, I mean, having somebody like one of those guys to say, hey, you run through there and fish spinners because you know that, hey, Dean is really good with spinners or Gilman or whoever that is in the group, and you're running cranks or vice versa, and you trust them because maybe they're catching seven pounders and you're catching five pounders or, or you can get some type of pattern, right? That maybe if we get a cold front that you're going to want to switch to meat and pull the plastic and throw that in the boat. And so you got a good idea for that. I think that the one thing that I definitely have seen with you would be work ethic. Like you're a hard worker, like grinding, but then also just being prepared and ahead of the game and not just reactive, right? Is that is term efficient? I, I think a lot of guys miss that. I think that I think that was the biggest attribute I had in my whole career. I always figured a way when it was tough to usually scramble and figure out how to catch five fish. Not all the time, but sometimes, you know, we've been catching here on a mud flat for two straight days, also the North Wind comes in and they go away. We need to leave that mud and we need to get on rocks or weeds or current and figure out how to put five fish in a boat. And um, the last two years I fished, that's I really concentrated on catching limits on some really tough bites and it paid some very big dividends to me. And uh, that was always a challenge at the end was it got harder the last couple of years I fished just to catch a limit. Uh, things were changing. Technology was changing. We'd been to a lot of bodies of water. So you had to look kind of at a here's normal A and B pattern. What's a C pattern? Where does a lot of people not fish? That's where I'm going to go try to figure out that and hopefully have it to yourself. I had most of East Devil's Lake to myself for about five years. Most people would always go west. I'd go east. And just because there was no people, I'd spend there wasn't as many fish down there, but they were mine. And when I found them, usually I could have it to myself, and I really enjoyed that a lot of times when I was there. I tell people all the time, I'd rather fish over 5,000 fish on Erie than 100,000 fish if I can be almost by myself because Amen. I feel like the numbers are you're way ahead because I can't catch 5,000 fish. And if I don't have people manipulating that, driving over them, the traffic, I don't think people understand how much boat traffic and things affect those, those fish. They are spooky, man. I agreed. I, I had five big wins in my life. I call major wins on all five of those things. The most common thing were I was by myself. For the most part, I was sure well, I was not sharing fish with anyone. Huge advantage. Huge, huge, huge. And when you got into a group at a dam, you know, in a spring term, you blow a dam and you're sharing with 50 boats. Good luck over three days. Good luck because usually they're gone. They're well, that's gone. just a that's just a crapshoot at that point. That's right, absolutely. And I tried everything in my ability to not fish that pattern. You know, like like when a bag in the old days, a lot of people used to go troll the mud. I would avoid trolling the mud at all cost because it's hard to hold that pattern three days in a row. And I knew that. And I would rather go find a rock or a weed or a river pattern that I know will hopefully be there three days in a row, where usually a mud pattern is going to disappear. And that was always my mental thinking. I think. If you are a guide or have a body of water that you call home, you don't like tournaments. I mean, maybe if you're going to go snipe them and win them. But, and I guess what I mean by this, like Winnebago, if you have something counted to yourself, you remember when Greg uh, Hiroki, or however you say yeah. his name there, he won that? I was there. Uh, yeah, my buddy there. Dave Hansen came in second, and those guys were pulling crankbaits like five feet behind boards that were – basically emulating white bass that those fish were targeting that nobody was, nobody was, you know, they're in the middle of nowhere. You're, you're not going to mark though. I mean, maybe with mega live now, you, you know, you could see some of those fish, but um, you know, the tournament things that they, they definitely open up, whether it's good or bad, a lot of different things, uh, you know, within a given body of water. And has there been anything like that, you know, kind of going to another one you can pick out of like the tournaments just totally turned on a bite that maybe everybody does now, you know, like, Spinner baits for with lead core as an example, well, maybe. That, that's what happened on the casting bite. You think about it, you know, uh, Keith and Gary Cavais figured out how to find him on locators and caught him shiver minnowing on baiting act. 
then I don't know what year it was, 17 or 16, we went to Green Bay. There was like seven guys casting total. And I think four of the top five were casters. I took second place. I was casting. Danny Wookie beat me. He was casting. And now three-quarters of field, field cast. Everyone you cast now. And back then, no one was casting. It was pretty crazy technology. But uh, it was fun to figure that bite out a couple of years before the masses got on to it. It got harder as it advanced. But the first few years, that was crazy. You know, catching them in eight, nine feet of water and see bottom gin clear. And I used to tell people that I didn't want to see bottom fish. And at the end, I didn't care. I actually was kind of vanished since I could see the fish before they bit. So, you know, it's crazy. You know, backing up a little bit, I just thought when you said about catching a limit, and I think all of us that fish, especially where, where I live on Lake Erie, right? Like, a, you know, a bad day there is a, a good day most places. But you're always <laughs> thinking you're always thinking you need 40 pounds. And I can remember winning an open as a much, much younger man with like 18 pounds or something because it was one of those days, you know, the wind switch yep. things, and you just yep. – and our buddy, John Bala, you know, he's always putting these, you, anybody that follows any of that stuff online sees he puts all these crazy stats yeah. together over tournaments. And I, I guess two questions for you would be personally winning a championship over the years would have made you more money, but to an angler, cause you've got ego. Anybody that's good at this has got an ego angler of the year is really kind of the title you want. If we're not really factoring money in there, is that fair? Amen. Amen. You know, I will say, the last year I fished in 2019, I won angle of the year, and I won a ring. Seriously, that's what I won. I won a class ring and a trophy. That's what I won. And, you know, if you win a championship, you win a boat and a pile of cash. But angle of the year was very rewarding and self-satisfying to me. So I, that particular year, it was tough fishing. I caught a limit every single day of competitive fishing. And in, in 2018, I caught a limit every single day of competitive fishing. And that means to me, personally, probably means more to me. Than winning an event, and you you are right. It's a it's it's an it's a I don't know if it's an ego thing. It's a motivating thing. I don't know what it is, but anybody can win a tournament, in my opinion. If you get the right bite, you're on the right body of water, you can win a tournament. But to consistently, you want every tournament then. Yeah, to catch a limit every single day is a little it's it's a little lucky. It truly is a little lucky to pull it off. And uh, you know, some of us did it, some of us didn't do it. You know, but yeah, it was it was very hard for me to do, but it's something I always wanted to do. So yep, I always strived to catch a limit. I, I looking through Bala's numbers, you know, and, and him kind of as I talk to him about these things, it's crazy to me that I mean, how many times guys don't catch a limit that you just assume? And maybe that's because where we live and fish a lot of places, mm -hmm. not Winnebago, but like a Green Bay. And even now, Green Bay fish is tough a lot of times. Oh. But yeah. I mean, how many, how many times that just catching a limit where if you came in and you go, hey, if I just weigh and, and he's got the numbers, you guys can look them up. But Oh, yeah. It doesn't look impressive, but the reality is, is when somebody, I, I always get this here because everyone's like, oh, Lake Easy on Erie. Erie can be really tough too. Is it probably the best lake in the country right now? Yes, but it can be really, really tough to the point people, what they don't understand is, and as, as a guide, it's no different than when, you know, you're fishing tournaments and obviously I fished a lot of tournaments back in the day is you have to go no matter what. So those guys that are like Lake Easy, they're not going when there's 30 degree cold front and four to six foot waves, right? You guys as tournament fishermen or guides or whatever that is, when you have to go every day and find out, I think you become a much better fisherman because you realize what you have to do when it's not simply putting a husky jerk behind a board and watching the thing sink. Amen. I, you know, I always would have multiple patterns in my brain and I was always very good at scattering, scattering. I always thought scattering the fighter planes. I'd scatter the fighters at 11 o'clock. I'd get my butt kicked. I'd call a walleye. And I'd try to, what's changed, what's went wrong. I'd have a backup plan in my head. You know, sometimes pre-fishing would pay off. Sometimes pre-fishing would not pay off. You know, so I was always not stubborn to say, hey, I caught them here three days in a row and they're gone. And some people would sit there and grind and grind and grind on them. But I would say, hey, they're gone. We need to figure out where they went. And a lot a lot of things would move with current and water temps, especially on the big water. On um, the Bay Green Bay, a lot of things would move with a the water went and wherever the current went and uh i got very good at figuring that out Corey springles figured that out you know where water goes is where the fish usually go and uh sometimes you just say hey this worked two days in a row but it's not gonna work the third day what do i do to figure it up the third day and that's that's what separates some of the better fishermen truthfully anybody that has done this has gone out and they know hey i caught 30 fish today here and i caught 40 pounds or whatever those numbers are it doesn't matter mm -hmm. and they show up the next day and go oh shit they're gone oh yeah i mean i i get to see it every day like just today but i've been fishing kind of the same when i say area you know it's bigger than some lakes 
but the area that we were fishing and those fish moved today from the time that I started about four miles back. And it was like, it was, and it was like, boom, boom. And it, it was fortunately again, everything's easier in Erie because we have more fish. So when your screen has more stuff on it and then it goes empty and then you find a full screen, it's not like some of the other bodies of water that maybe other guys are listening to this or that, you know, you fished in the past. It's easier to, to, to locate, you know, a thousand fish instead of a hundred or whatever it may be. But what is your first move when you pull in like that and you go, they're gone? I, uh, I, I guess a prime example was I fished baiting hawk year, one year. I was in second place in that tournament. I was catching all my fish down south of Ford River. The water temperature was 68 to 69 degrees. I rolled it on day four of the championship, final day. Ten guys were going out fishing. I rolled and the water dropped 17 degrees overnight. And I was like, oh, God, you know they're gone. The water had been dirty and warm before. Now it's gin clear. I can see bottom in 16 feet of water. First thing you got to think to yourself, where'd the water go? So where, where did the water go? And I actually, from past history, knew that when water moves on baiting, that kind of where it goes. So I turned and went up to Minneapolis Shoals. I drove almost 15 and a half miles somewhere. I was catching my fish three days in a row, caught all my fish, set up the water 72 and a half degrees and murdered them. I mean, literally murdered them. And it was easy. But, you know, that's the biggest thing is knowing what to do to react. And, um, you know, same thing you obviously fish Detroit River, you fish Lake Erie. When that wind blows up Detroit River, Detroit River gets tough. When that wind blows up and you see those buoys stand up and go calm, there's no current, Detroit River gets very challenging. And that's where you got to say to yourself, you know, if I'm allowed to go in the lake, maybe I need to go in the lake. And uh, that's just things that you learn as you fish more and more and more. What to do, if the sun's out in Lake Erie, or if it gets cloud or dark, what happens? And that was some of the things over years of fishing and fishing, you kind of had a pattern in your brain this happened, and that's what happened to me when I won a last time I was at Lake Erie. I actually won won a turn, won the tournament, and uh, I had been catching on my fish really super high on flashy bright baits. Sun was out every day; it was windy. Day one, the tournament was dark, rainy, and flat. Come, what happened? All the fish weren't high anymore. They went to bottom, and I went down to bottom and caught them. Where most people didn't make that adjustment, truthfully, uh, just from past experience. Yeah. And, and again, sometimes they do the opposite thing. We all have these kind of preconceived notions. And again, as much time as I've spent on that body of water, you think you know what they're going to do. And then all of a sudden they just, they don't do that. And oh, I've been there many times in my life. Winnebago was the same thing where you think you'd have Winnebago figured out. Boy, the next day it was gone. And it was like, what the heck happened? I don't, I, sometimes I still don't know what happened. I really don't. And I've always, I, but I'm the guy that's driving home and a month later, I'm still thinking, where'd they go? Where did they go? And that would irritate me that I didn't know where they went. And I'd watch it, watch the TV show four days later, and I'd see how the guys caught. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I should have known better than that. That was the most humility thing when you'd watch some of the TV shows after you got your butt kicked and where these guys caught. I'm like, oh, God. But whatever. You live and learn. Well, and, and I think that that's the thing that, you know, a lot of people listening to this probably are not going to be tournament fishermen or that's not their desires or what have you. But I would say guides, tournament fishermen, and just guys that are really, really, really hardcore fishermen. In a lot of cases, those guys are actually better than some of the guides and and tournament fishermen by some of the guys that I know. But they are better simply because they're fishing on those tough days and they learn those movements. I know I kind of already said that, but I, I don't think people really understand that. Like You can't understand these fish when you're just on a whack a fest. I agree. You know, when in the good days of Lake Erie, if you didn't bring in 40 pounds, you got your butt kick. And I liked when you used to go. I, I my favorite tournament was a go to when it was challenging. If you caught five fish, you're gonna do you're gonna do well. You got a limit of three pounders, you're doing well. Those are my favorite tournaments because you might get two trolling, one casting, and two live rate rigging on a point. And that's what the Mississippi fished a lot. And Mississippi would fish and change a lot. And that was always a big advantage to me because I could change with it. And I just say, hey. After pre-fishing for four days, I'd have to have I'd have an idea in my brain that hey, it'd take 18 pounds of data to make the top 10, and my goal was always top 10 and let's roll from there. And uh, I just 18 pounds a day. Somehow I need to figure a way to catch 18 pounds. And usually when I made those predictions, top 10, I was usually pretty spot on. I had a lot of information in my brain in previous, and uh, that was always what I got to do to catch 18 pounds. You know, maybe I got to go at two big ones. Rigging creek chubs, get lucky and get a seven and a five pounder, and let's go fill up on two pounders. And uh, that's what I think I was really good. Where a lot of people would go, they'd get them two big ones, and they'd sit all day and come in with two. Or at the end, I'd beat them because I went and got a three pounder, two two pounders to beat them. So, yep. So, backing up a little bit for people that don't, you know, do this or understand, like, 
you can be, I used to do some guiding in college for salmon on Lake Michigan. And on a day that you couldn't even stand how hot it was, this is on the Michigan side. I mean, you couldn't even stand it. You, you would jump in, which no, I don't allow that anymore, but you would jump in and your feet, you you'd think you're in an ice bath, right? The water layers so much different than like Lake Erie where I'm at. Yes, we have a temperature break, but nothing, nothing close to what you have on Lake Michigan and the attached bodies of water that you fish like Bay Knock and Green Bay. So when you're doing that and that water may blow in, like you said, 20, 30 degrees difference, or maybe that's a little high exaggeration, but not by much. Mm -hmm. On Erie, ours would be water clarity. Is that, we don't really have the temperature, but the water clarity would be, have you found that in, in most of your, your travels? Oh, Lake Erie for sure, especially springtime. You know that you, you didn't want clean water. You didn't want dirty water. You want in between water, and you and I know that in between water was really if you see, if you saw your prop turning or golden, and uh, it was all about temps. You know the big females would usually be laying in that warmer water, didn't want to be in the cold water. If you could find that in between, that was the spot. But the problem with the, some of the biggest mistake I made in Lake Erie in my in my days, and you just had said the same thing a few minutes ago, which I was laughing about, is you don't fish coordinates in Lake Erie. And what I mean by that is you might catch them here one day. But because of the current going two and a half miles an hour, they might be 15 miles away the following day because they drifted all night and with a two mile current, they, they're drifting and swimming. They might be 14 miles away. So you had to be the guy who could just turn your boat, go in the right direction and be willing to pick up and move a mile or shoot three miles or shoot five miles, watch color, watch temp, watch all those things. Once I stopped fishing GPS coordinates on Lake Erie, I became a lot better fisherman. And I know I caught him here yesterday, but that doesn't mean they're going to be here today. And the guy that could, hey, scramble the fighters, watch your fish locator, watch every asset or tool you had was the guys at the end of the day usually did pretty well. And that was some of the mistakes I made at Lake Erie. Hey, I caught him here yesterday, and I grind and grind. I get one. Instead of catching three a pass, I'm catching one six-pounder instead of catching three eight-pounders. That was some of my biggest mistakes I ever made. It's easy to fish memories. I mean, I always tell people, on one, like especially in the springtime, like you said, you've got three things you're looking at. Above the water, it's boats. I don't want to be around them. It, you know, on the water, I'm looking at the clarity and then below it is the current factor. And if you get those three things working in your favor, it doesn't matter where you're at. And like you said, that, that's, it's going to move a lot. So forget that GPS screen. Don't look at that plotter so close and don't be and, afraid to put the boat up. Amen. Don't be afraid to move and just find that pod. Cause when you, you know, where you fish it all the time, Ross, you fish it more than me, but when you're marking them, you catch them. If you're not marking, you don't catch them. And that's pretty simple. And like here with some bodies of water, we have to almost believe because there's not a large number of them. We got to believe, and um, now it, with some of the new technology, it might not have to be anymore. In the old days, you had to believe that they were going to be there, and you troll and troll and troll and troll and troll, and also you might find them, especially if they're stratospheric high. You had to believe because you couldn't see them, and you had to just troll. And sometimes it would take you four hours to locate them, but once you caught them, you could catch them in 45 minutes, and that was the whole key. I used to tell my coworkers that walleye fishing is very simple when you find them. It's very simple and very easy, and don't get discouraged at noon if we don't have any. Because at one o'clock we will have them all. You just got to find that pod, and once you found that pod, they're not a very hard fish to catch. And I, I think that's a good point we're bringing up. Like even I've fished with you on outer section of Green Bay and Bay to Knock, and you're fishing almost. You have to know that the fish are going to be there in those conditions because you're not going to see them, whether they're high or there's not that many of them, or they're in the rocks. And it's almost like that though on Erie as we get towards the eastern side of the Central Basin. You know, now not as much because we've got more fish or the eastern basin itself. My buddy Todd Frank, you know, fished over there in New York. And he used to always say, put your shit down and go. Get yourself in the best area and just take advantage of the bites and, and keep your stuff going. Because you can fish all day and just whack them and never mark a fish down there. Now, yeah. obviously, things like Mega Live are going to probably change that a little bit. But those fish, I've watched them. So people, that, I think producer is going to put some stuff up this winter. We were ice fishing. It's a good, good story that you'll probably even appreciate. And I've got the Mega Live on down mode, and we've got 25 foot of coverage, right? So with the flasher, what we got 10 or 12 if we're lucky, right? Yeah. And yeah. I watched the guy; he was jigging all crazy, and I'm like, dude, he's up, he's up. Like that's that's not how we fish that. And I watched five fish come in like off bottom, like prime, just smoke fast, big, juicy, nice marks. And again, with the Mega Live, it's like a video game. You watch them come in, and this guy started jigging all crazy. Those fish stopped and literally backed up you know they're like no 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 how many times have me and you probably been in that scenario we didn't know that that was the wrong stroke or the right bait we never oh. knew those fish were there we never knew they were there 
Agreed. Now because our eyes are so much better, and I, and I kind of apply that thinking the same thing with a boat of how many times those fish just go right around us. Because even I can just look at this week alone when I run and people always go, how come you don't start to fish finder while you're fishing as much? I go, when I'm driving at 25, 30 miles an hour, they can't all get out of the way. But I know that that screen isn't nearly as full is what it is because i mean they go out to the side of the boat and that's why we're using planer boards you know we got them spread out 50 100 feet to the side and that's where the fish are going we're literally funneling them to where our lures are at i mean i ran a flat line for four or five hours they never caught a fish on it <laughs> i mean I, I used to call it a deer i used to call it a, my analogy was always a deer drive because you're almost if you're running over fish in four or five feet of water and you're pushing them side by getting their, their ice to their fat butts off the bottom, when they swim left or right, you're activating them. And hopefully by them getting active, a bait goes by them, they're going to eat it. And I thought that was some of the advantages of trolling with a kicker motor and like staying on the Mississippi River or something, you could wake them up. I think the motor woke them up sometimes and kick them. And some of the bites you get on a 10 foot life core robber brutal. Because I think you, you woke that fish up, you move him to the side, and he's swimming away, and he just drills it. Well, it takes their, you swear you snag the bottom, and also it's a five pounder. And that, that was pretty crazy stuff. So, I've mean, we talked about the Great Lake stuff, but on some of the reservoirs or maybe western rivers and things, what are those difference makers that we, you know, we talked about some of the bigger bodies of water that we both fish, but for guys that are out west or maybe not even, maybe they're down south, but more reservoirs or just different scenarios, what have been some of those difference makers that's like you got to figure out, learn the hard way or whatever it is, but you better do it? I, I think in a lot of the reservoirs, a big difference, a lot of them is clarity because most of the reservoirs got pretty clean water, you know, so I think. Some of the things that we've proven and tournaments have proven is how many fish do relate to, relate to trees that are 50 to 80 years old. I mean, those trees have been in the water forever and still fish still react to them. I put so many crankbaits in one one particular tree in Lake uh, South Dakota. I don't know how many, uh, Lake Hawaii, I don't know how many baits are in there, but I put oodles of them in one tree. But if you didn't hit the branches and it didn't rip off at accelerated speed, they wouldn't bite it. And that was just how you had to catch them. And so you'd go in and you'd pray that two of your three baits had come through on skate. And, but usually I'd break a shad drop up almost every single pass through it. But when you'd rip off a branch, that's when the biggest fish would trigger them to bite. And with today's technology, we might well go to probably Mega Live, see them, and probably snipe them with some kind of plastic or something now because technology's changed. We could probably do things different. But the thing about the reservoirs, too, is don't be afraid to fish deep. Um, the, you know, a lot of people think deep is deep. On, on some of those reservoirs, you know, mo a lot of the fish are loose to living in that. 22, 23, 30, 30, 35, 40 feet of water or deeper. And, and I think that's some of the mistakes some people make. Sometimes they get caught up. Hey, we caught them pulling by the months with half a night crawling 17 feet of water the last two years. Where are they this year? Probably because they went deep. And um, I've watched walleyes come up. The deepest water I've caught in my life, I caught a fish in 72 feet of water on uh, Leech Lake on a jigging wrap. Then 72 feet of water, I marked him, dropped it down, caught him. And he was off body before he got to the service, he was dead which I felt really bad about. And I learned something about how to fight fish a little differently. But um, I don't, I think that's as the water cleans up and it gets clear, um, you know, like the Bay of Green Bay or a little Bay Knot is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Some of the fish continue to go deeper and deeper. And um, I think there's a bunch of untapped walleyes that are deeper than we think. And that I don't think it's being fished, to be honest with you. And if I was going to get back and determine fish, that'd probably be some of the fish I would look at is some of those fish that aren't getting fished as deep anymore. Well, it's funny you should say it because I don't know if you were, I think you were probably in on that. When I was a kid and this whole trolling thing was evolving in like the middle 90s, mm -hmm. you almost couldn't fish. If you came in and you got your butt kicked, it was because you didn't fish high enough. You, Amen. You know, it was like, hey, we're fishing 10 or 12 feet down. That's crazy. Like growing up here, you know, because we had the dirty water, Cuyahoga River caught on fire. You couldn't fish high enough. And then all of a sudden you come in and some guy says, well, I caught him six feet down. And you're like, oh. And then there was, you know, three or four feet down. You're like, oh. <laughs> uh, I did a lot right? of those in those days. When I'd watch those TV shows, I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. I, I, had to be, I had to be 30 back on that Husky jerk now or 10 back. Or I can remember like the reef runners, you know, eight back or it was was like a number. And you're like, it was sinking boards. And we were set, setting our equipment up differently. And But now it's completely opposite. Producer dude, I'm sure we'll put a little plug up here for shameless plug. We just shot a thing. Uh, this summer where I went out and said, hey, we went down to the central basin near the Pennsylvania line and the fish, the, the thermocline had broken up, like literally while we're there, the storm came, you know, and it kind of just uh, jacked it all up. And you could see it as it started to reestablish. It was like between 55 and 65 feet down. That's where the fish were at. And most guys probably aren't equipped 
to have gear to do that. It's not crazy fancy, but you've got to have specialized equipment for that. You know, I was adding snap weights to my lead core, you know, to get multiple lines down because I didn't have enough to fish deep and we're using big snap weights. And it, there's just, I, I'm hundred percent with you that the fish are deep, right? And I think it's the water clarity thing too, because zebra mussels have gotten into so many other bodies of water. Number one, number two, I think everybody's, you know, the clean water act that, you know, maybe Florida would disagree with this, but so many of the bodies of water that we fish are just healthier than they used to be. Yeah, when zebra, when zebra mussels and gobies got in, we thought they were going to be bad. And I say this, and unless you like to walk on a beach in certain places, I think they've actually helped in some degree. You know, some things that's done in Green Bay, it's cleaned the water for sure. It's put a lot, a whole new food, a food source in there now for the smallies and the boat. They target gobies. The whitefish population is through the roof. And, you know, is that because of the gobies? Probably. Um, our wheat growth's never been better because of base cleaned up and cleaned up and cleaned up. You know, there's there's pluses and minuses with that whole thing. But, you know, something, some reality has probably helped as much as you hate to say that, but it probably actually has. But, you know, like you said, look at Lake Erie's went through. That's crazy. That's just crazy. That's a Winnebago, too. You know, Winnebago, when I was a kid, and I first started fishing my first year, most fish, most trimmers are one they're catching soggers. They were. You know, you could get a limit of 17 inch soggers. You want a lot of money. And how you watch that change now evolve because the water's got cleaner. There's more walleyes, there's less saugers, walleyes grow bigger, so now the are one on walleyes. But back in the old days, it was sauger, sauger, sauger. And I think a lot of that has to do with zebra mussels, to be honest with you. So what fishing deep, what is your what is your preferred way to do that, or how would you do that today? Depends how deep I gotta go. You know, it's all depending on how deep I gotta go. You know, if I'm gonna go once again, if I'm if I'm jigging for them, if I'm jigging for them, I'm gonna catch them with either some kind of minnow profile, be either a jigging wrap or a shiver minnow, because I can target snipe individual fish. If I'm going to troll for them, I, I personally like, I don't like weights on my baits. I never have. Um, the reason why it is if I put a two ounce uh, weight on my bait, it's hard for me to control speed on my boat to get exact precision trolling. So I would do everything in my ability to not do that. And for, I don't know if I ever caught a tournament in a walleye using a weight truthfully in front of my bait other than a spinner. But if I put a crankbait, I would either long line the deepest bait I could get, like a big reef runner, for example, I can get them down 28 feet. I'd run braid and run a leader to them to get them deeper and longer to the smaller diameter. But if I had to go deeper, I'd go to lead core. I, I think I, I think lead core is either control depth control versus weights, in my opinion. Um, I know you guys do a lot of jets and you guys do a lot of dipsies and a lot of wire and that whole thing. I never fished a turn in my life where I caught a wally in a dipsy or jet, truthfully, never did. And, um, I just something we didn't do here, but like I love put a spinning rod in my hand and go and look and try to snipe them with either a jig and wrap or rip and wrap or a shiver minnow or something that profile style bait. That's a great way to catch them, especially if they're set up right. And what I mean by that, if they're set up in certain rocks where you can actually physically see them, they're pretty easy to catch. You know, if I can mark them in 27 feet of water and I know they're walleyes, I can probably catch them. And um, that's what a lot of Green Bay has become now, truthfully. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I just today I was pulling weights on crankbaits, and but it, you're right. The what works and doesn't work is such a fine line because the variables just go through the roof. Where something like lead core is going to distribute that weight over, you know, 100 feet or whatever it may be, 50 feet. That was feet, always my feet. theory. Exactly what you're saying, Ross. That was always my theory. And obviously, you fish Lake Erie all the time. The current there is immense. People don't realize how strong that current is. If you start pulling a weight in the current with the current, your depth changes immensely. So I, I even if it's calm, there's a lot of current normally, and I know you know that. And uh, I was, as I became a better fisherman, I always paid attention to current, and it made a big difference for me. Yeah, I did so much that I helped uh, develop that X2 with Fishhawk, where you know we've got basically a portable version of that, and that really, really helps. I mean, but Huge. there's 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 so many variables with it, and you can't even talk about it. You have to just do it to understand it, and you you try to get the closest guessing that you can, because I don't think what people realize and that don't ice fish. And so I know you do. So let's talk about that for one second. If you, you never, I don't think you've ever been out here with me at ice fishing on Erie, but you can be going and the wind in your lure will be almost blown out of your hole. So you can't see it on a flasher. Out of same the thing at Green Bay. Green Bay, the yeah. same thing. Yep. And then 45 minutes later, it's out of the South and then it's out of the West and then it's out of the East. And, and it's like, boom, boom, boom. And you all of yep. a sudden you got to, then, then the, you got no current. And then that doesn't move the bait and stuff. So you, you hate the current, but yet you love it because it moves the fish and the bait. Our and you're on an eighth of an ounce or a flutter spoon, and all of a sudden you need a three-quarter ounce just chunker lead to get down to the bottom. And, and I tell people, think about that. That's with 
ice over it and with generally less wind, you know, and things that we have and we don't have the flow from the rivers and things dumping in. And, and that's really the deal where, you know, you're going one direction and you catch the tar out of them. You turn around and go back and go, man, it's flat calm. How come I ain't catch anything? You got her. That's that you are, you are figured it out. What's crazy too is people always, you know, I know you know this, but the wind can be blowing ice fishing out of the north, but the current's going into the north. And you watch that. And what's really funny is we fish a lot of whitefish deep on the Bay of Green Bay. When the current's blowing, they bite. You can't see your jig a lot of times because the current's blowing so hard. You can't see it. But when it quits blowing, you see them, but they do not bite. So when it when it quits blowing, you must have a sandwich, go fire up the grill. Because 45 minutes later, when it picks up, it's go time again. And it's it's all current driven. And, uh, you know, that's, I think, the whole key to becoming a better walleye fisherman is just learning that concept. And I know you figured it out now if it's calm. Once in a while, you only get them going one way. Why is that? It's calm. It shouldn't matter, but it does. And it's all current driven. Then the following day, the current might go the other way. You might catch them going the other way. So, yeah, it's, I I always tried if there was a buoy, if there was a buoy or something by that buoy, if there was no wind, I, a lot of times I'd sit down by that buoy and float for a minute just so I get an idea of which way the current's going, hope it gets speed on what it's looking. Or when I go by in the river, I'd always watch cans because they're tipped hard or tipped vice versa. You can get an idea which current's going when there's not much wind blowing. So, mm -hmm. We've had a bunch of the fisheries guys on our podcast, and that has been like, if people, I, I, it's not like exciting information, but we get pretty good numbers on that because, I mean, these guys really bring it. And one term that uh, I'm probably saying it wrong, but it's called a, like a reverse sight. So basically, to your point, when it's blowing out of the north, the bottom current is going the opposite way. Because if you think about it, when we don't have ice, when all these harbors on the south side of the lake empty out and there's no water in them, you watch the docks go down three or four feet. And Canada doesn't have it in, in their in their bathtubs or in their backyards. It's basically that whole water is lifting up, and then that return flow is coming back. So exactly to your point, when you have a north wind, usually the current's coming the opposite way near the bottom, and then all that pocket current. It's funny you say that because I was out salmon fishing two weeks ago. We were in a river with waders, waders fishing uh, kings and coho salmon, and there's current early in the morning to drift your bobber would spawn. Then also the current just stops. It just stops on a river. It's like what the hell. It just stops. And all of a sudden, you know, you're waiting all like 15 minutes later. Here it comes again. It's exactly the same thing. And we're fishing down close to the river mouth. So that current stopped and it, you don't catch any fish. And all of a sudden it starts blowing again. I see you start catching a few. When it gets blown hard, you catch them. Also, it stops. You don't catch them again. It's crazy. I've never experienced that my whole life until this last couple weeks ago fishing the steelhead and caught salmon and stuff. It was crazy. Nothing. I've never seen like it my whole life. Nuts. You know, I know you're a crankbait guy. You've told me many a times, give me a fire tiger, a crankbait, probably a shad wrap or something, right? And you're and you're happy. But I think it's fair to say that, you know, meat or spinners, whatever you want to call them, has done. I mean, again, the guys you fished with, you had to pick up some stuff or be, again, the trust factor, like we talked about, like Gilman or an Olson. And those guys are, are great spinner fishermen. How did spinners play a role in your career or in your fishing, just in general? You know, I started as a kid. That's how we caught while I was growing up on Bay Knock. When I was 10, 12, 13, 14, I used to tie spinners and actually sell them at the local grocery store by my house. And that's how we learned to catch walleyes on Bay Knock, first tournament fishing my whole life. I didn't know what I was doing. We were pulling lindy sinkers for weights over deep water with spinners, and that's how we caught them all. And so I always I evolved and got better at it. Use fluorocarbon leaders, use treble looks, vice versa, certain colors, UVs, whatever. As we got better at it, but spinners played a big role in my life catching walleyes, obviously. But to this day, which I'm embarrassed to actually say this, I never, ever won a single tournament on a spinner. I did really good, but I never won a tournament on a spinner, which is embarrassing for me to say because I considered myself to be an elite spinner fisherman in the early 2000s. And I came close a bunch of times. But I never won a tournament. Then we started fishing crankbaits and certain things and going faster. Then I think I had some advantages, advantages, but I never won one. Did very well many times. But I think spinners, the biggest thing on spinners was in the old days of Lake Erie was you're getting the husky jerks. You're getting them on reef runners. The water's cleaning up. The water's getting warmer. When do you switch gears? When do you freaking finally at 10, 30 in the morning, do you finally say enough's enough? You put the husky jerk away and you go to spinners. And that was always the hardest decision in my brain to make was when do you pull the pin? When do you pull the pin and when you do it? And uh, yeah, sometimes, I pulled, sometimes I pull too early. Sometimes I pull perfect. You know, it was always a big guess. But once you can start, in my opinion, once you can start catching my lake here on spinners in the old days when there was big fish, big, big fish, um, I always thought I could catch bigger fish on spinners once it's set up correctly. I think spinners caught bigger fish, in my opinion. Really? I, I'm shocked to hear you say that, to be honest with you. I think, to me, the difference between spinners and cranks, 
I, I, I don't. I think some of the big old really fussy walleyes would hit a spinner when they wouldn't hit a crank if things were equal. But you can basically, is this fair to say that ideal spinner speed, ideal crankbait speed is about a mile apart in most cases. Agreed. Agreed. It may be a mile and a half. So at the end of the day, you're going to cover six, eight, nine more miles. And if it's six to one, half a dozen the other. Yeah. No dice. You might be right on that too, but you think about what we've learned with live scope now. And how many fish glide up and look at that bait and don't eat it? So how many fish came up on a big husky jerk or a reef runner and didn't eat it? But instead, he comes up behind a night crawler, he nibbles it, and he eats it. And I, and I, and I think I can't imagine how many walleyes looked at our crankbaits and didn't eat them. I did got numbers astonishing, sickening actually, sickening numbers. Where I think I think a spinner sometimes you got a little slower presentation, you can slow down. They may come up and you know get behind it and juice it a little bit. And I think if they juice and like it, they're going to juice it all. And I think that's why some of the spinner bites you'd see, you get the nibble, 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 berry. And I think that was some of that thing. Is That's my theory. And it's amazing, you know, what I've learned the last couple of years of salmon and steelhead fishing, which I've done a lot in the last three years, is when we're floating, the water's, whatever, 38 degrees, springtime, the ice is still in the river, and you're floating a bobber down with steel, for steel, and you watch the bobber go, dink, 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 poof. So they're actually, they're, they're coming up on that spawn. They're nibbling it. They're tasting it. They're tasting it. They like it. They juice it. And I think that was my theory some of the spinnerfish, too. But I, I, I don't know that, but that was just my opinion. I, I a thousand percent agree. I mean, you know, the funny thing is one of my my clients not that long ago, was sometime this year, said, you know, we caught 40, 50 fish. I mean, we had a great day, right? Better than most, but it didn't That's even matter. A day. That's a pretty good day. I mean, it, it, people, I hear all the time when they're like, how many did you catch? Oh, I caught like 50 or 60. It's like, well, it was probably 20. Because to catch 50 fish just sitting yeah. and doing, I mean, that's you're, you're pretty much reeling nonstop. I think that's fishermen, right. sometimes their numbers get a little skewed. But and the funny thing is he said to me, because he, he's like, man, this is amazing, isn't it? I said, dude, this is crazy. I mean, this is really good fish. Our, our, our quality of fish was amazing. And he, he looked at me and he goes, yeah, but think of how many fish we drove over. He goes, we probably missed thousands. I go, thousands? Probably hundreds of thousands. Yeah, think about that number. And I, I think about this day is – some of those tournaments where I took a second or took a third or took a fourth or took whatever. How many fish did I throw my bait bar come by that would have won me that tournament and didn't bite? Just think about that one seven pounder you drove by and doubles like he eats you in or vice versa. You know, and you just think about that number and that you make me not sleep at night. I'd be always thinking about that stuff. What could I have done to caught that one more? Tell me what makes you a better spinner fisherman than the average guy or what, what are the factors that are the make it happen thing? Uh, you know, I, I think one of my one of my best things that made me do is I, I called it I called it hook ratio. Um, I had a I had a tournament in Lake Erie. Um, I don't know what place. I think I had the top ten. It was good, but I had forty seven hookups in three days and landed forty seven. Forty seven for forty seven. So forty seven fish hooked. Forty seven fish came in my boat, and that was one thing I think I was really good at doing. I, I think it started with a using really good hooks, and I think b giving them a little bit extra time to eat it before you engage them and see when you get them by the boat slow down until you can hit them just slow the boat down and i i hardly ever lost a fish in my career i lost a few but not many and when i get them close to the boat i have no problem putting my boat at 0.5 miles an hour net in them i, just, I don't i don't I, I go slow slow and slower because my rule of thumb was if I fish, I'd always, you know, in 10, you fish every single day. You know, within 10 minutes when you get a call on your boat, if, if he's a fisherman, you know, you know, you can tell a guy who's doing some sets. You know it. And if I got a guy in the boat who could fish, all right, Roger, you're reeling them all in today. You know what you're doing. As long as you listen, you're reeling every single fish. I'm at them all. That's fine. But also you get that one guy, he's like, a little gun shy about him. You know, I might have to worry about, but if I didn't feel right, then I'd take them all. I'd, I'd reel on all our big, all our big trunk. I'd reel them on. And I'd say, you do not net until I tell you. And I'd repeat it a thousand times on camera. No, no, just wait, just wait. I'll bring them right to the net. You just got to lift the net. And I slowed down. You get an eight, nine, ten pounder. You don't get too many of those. You want to put them in the boat. And I think the one big advantage is I was always, believe it or not, even though I do everything else really fast in my life, when it would come to the last 10 seconds, I could slow down and make sure that opportunity was exercised and uh, I did a very good job with that. But I think, and I think, I think one thing I did different than everyone else is I use small hooks. Most people use, you know, big giant number fours and the, or sixes in the back of their travel hooks and their spinners. I use number tens. I use a little tiny hook. And my theory was that a little tiny hook is a lot easier to penetrate skin than a big hook is putting through skin or bone. 
has full speed, has full speeds. And I use a little tiny little hook, and people used to make fun of hooks all the time. But hook 47, fishing Lake Erie Line 47, that's the odds we wanted to obviously do good. So that's a little treble hook, round bend treble. What are you using on your front hook? I always do, I always use a number 10 VMC on the back, and I always use a number 2 uh, wide gap, you know, VMC on the front. I use VMC hooks all my life, and Rapalos, I was a sponsor of mine, so I use their product, obviously. And um, those hooks were very successful for me. And I used to change. I was the guy in the harbor who would be casting baits, trolling baits while we're waiting to go out to making sure they're perfectly, perfectly tuned. And I was that guy. I always tried to do that. So when you, you get the reef hunter thing, there's certain reef hunters that would catch a lot of fish. And there were certain reef hunters that wouldn't catch a lot of fish. And that was just a matter of how they were molded, how the lip went on, how it bent. When you found the, the I used to call it the Dalai Lama. When the Dalai Lama was found, you'd mark it with a Sharpie. And the Dalai Lama would only fish during tournament hours. And that's factual. I would save it for tournament. Yep. The pa- paper baits, money baits. Amen, brother. And that's, you know, that's how you paid for your living. You paid for your house, support your kids in college for certain baits. And and the last time I won Lake Erie, I had these lures in my box. I hadn't used them for three years. I hadn't used that particular bait, but the colors adjusted. And I put that bait on, and every one of them was all hand-tuned. They had all little X's on them. So I, as soon as I dropped in the water, I was like, this could get interesting fast. And it got interesting really fast. It, it, I'm not going to tell them, but I know what the color is, too. <laughs> that's fine. I don't care. Whatever. I don't fish anymore. I don't care. I just fish for fun anymore. I really don't care. Yeah, you you had some interesting colors that were your go-tos. That was always yeah. always intriguing. I did. Yep. And, you know, I think uh, everyone's got a favorite. You know, everyone's got a favorite deer stand. Everyone's got a favorite whatever. And when the chips are down, you put a certain bait on. And my theory is like when I used to fish the Mississippi River or wherever I was going, if I'm grinding crankbaits, I put a joint shadow down. But I don't care what we're catching. I put on a joint shadow. I know they run right. I know they're going to, every fish that bites, I'm going to eat it, and I'm going to catch them. And I might get seven bites, I'm going to catch all seven. And it was just a confidence thing. When I put that bait out, I'm going to catch them. And uh, you probably don't remember this, but when I wrote a book probably 10, 12 years ago, yep. and we included you in it. And yep. what you probably don't remember is I asked you for a quote, and I'll have to censor it slightly, what you told me. But basically, it was, I said, you know, what do you have to do? What's the simple thing somebody can do to be a better fisherman? And I, I thought of that because my answer to my own question would have been, you know, with spinners is know when you have a bite. Because so many, and that was your answer is because you, I don't know, in very Tom-like fashions, you know, said, ah, I see that guy's got one on his middle board over there. He doesn't even know it. You know, there's so many guys that don't know when they have a bite. Um, to rather, if you're spinner fishing, it's to drop them or to maybe take up the slack because he's swimming with you uh, because of the current factor. People, they always think that everything's towed right behind that board, right? And that's yep. just not the case so many times. And to me, that would be the biggest thing is just learning what a fish bite looks like. Not one that smokes it, but those other ones. And that's a lot of times the biggest fish, especially with spinners. Always. You, I, I would agree. Always. The biggest fish would always be the most black skilled days of crazy bite. You missed them once, you dropped it to them. You missed them twice, you dropped them, you caught them. And uh, that was usually the, honestly, like you just said, usually the one or two toads that you need to make a difference in doing good or doing great. And that was usually that one or two toad was always that real crappy little bite. And that's what baiting knock fish too. Baiting knock fish were very, very light bites at times. Some of the biggest fish at the Minneapolis Shoals, you know, they're current, they live in current all their life. And you get that little ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding, and you'd kind of drop, drop down, boom, they power slam it underwater. Then you got him. Once he pulls it underwater, he's mine, obviously. But And that was some of the biggest bites I always were, was watching that. And, uh, you know, I, I was I was always sponsored by offshore products. And, I, and uh, Bruce O'Shannon and his family supported me all my life. And uh, I used to love, I, I was really a tattletale fly fisherman. I, I, I learned and it brained myself how, how to read that board by pulling that board. I never used a lot of tattletale flags, which a lot of people did. I just, I never did on my corner. says, why don't you use them? I just, it's a confidence thing, just something I did all my life and the way I watch things and do things different. And um, it's just what I did and how I did it. So, yep. Yeah, I think that uh, I've learned the most about fishing stuff. And it's probably just like you because I know you're like a, a computer with a remember, hey, this happened here, this happened there. Mm-hmm. I always have things in the back of my mind. And I've learned most of them ice fishing, like looking at an aqua view. And I can remember watching a big, I mean, eight pound plus fish come in, mouth closed, take a jigging wrap and hit it like a, like a, like a dolphin, you know, totally closed mouth, zero intentions on, on, on striking that bait and just to see what it would do. Right. Cause he knew something wasn't right where that three pounder probably engulfs it, chokes it down. No problem. And I think of the same thing with spinners. I've had fish where you drop them or you got them or those bites are so soft that you're like, there's no way that's a bite. And I know that you know that they are, or at least you, you treat it like it's a bite regardless. 
always, I mean, uh, always. And, you know, it's, it's funny, too. You think about it, how many of them walleyes, you know, they come up and bite that spinner. They might nibble at it, pull at it, nibble at it, pull at it. You don't get them. And also, you pull it away from him. He might have a friend, too, that sees it getting away. He smashes it. Like, look how many times you, know, you catch a bass and there are bass turning you have his mouth. I think it's the same way with Wallace. You would agree. I really, truly do. And I think if there's five fish laying on a rock pile and you jack one on a shad wrap going three and a half miles an hour, the next bait that's coming through at three and a half miles at seven feet behind, he might jack him, too. And I think that's part of the, part of the reason sometimes you get doubles. I think there's some jealousy there that he, he tried to get that baby, didn't get it, or it got away from him, and, then, and his partner gets it. And a lot of times that's why you'd have two light core rods eight feet apart and you take a double. All right, Tom. So I feel like we've been a little too like nice to each other because those of us that really know me and you, there's some serious ball busting going on. So I feel like your biggest weakness is boat rigging. And when you used to call a screwdriver, a plus and a minus, I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't feel too bad about it either. That's a Phillips yeah, and a flathead. I think, to us I think some people. of that, uh, that some of that could be stretched a little bit, you know, obviously uh, some things changed in my life and some of my uh, partnerships changed. And um, the last about six years, I rigged my own stuff. So I think some of that could be, a little maybe stretched, but also, am I am I a fixer guy? No, I got I, I make enough money I can pay people to fix stuff for me to be honest. With that. That, that, I, I feel I'm scared for the people that have bought your boats in the last five or six years. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm a little scared for you, but um, I feel like we also can't go much farther. Do you want to tell people what an ankle pick is, or do you do you? I mean, do you want to relive that? Do you remember when you learned? No, about- I. I I, re- I recall it one time you were you were getting a little lippy and I thought I was gonna give you a bit a beat down and you snuck up behind me and put me in an ankle pick. There, there, there was no sneaking up. It was on the front deck. It was 2007 FLW Championship in Cleveland, and we had I think it was old Jason Seelock who's with Wired to Fish now and he was with FLW at the time. And I I made you tap out. I made you tap out. And you were like, well, "What is that move? What is that? that's an ankle pick." And it's I got I got to almost take as a compliment though when you you remember that in 2017 you put me in ankle pick and that's one of your career highlights so I'm gonna take that as a compliment. 2007 and the only reason I know that is I was talking to Gilman earlier today when we were driving he's like do you remember when you made Tom tap out I'm like you know I kind of do and he's like that was the championship in 2007 so you, you're not on my yeah, highlights boy. you're not on my highlights I think but- the statues have run out on that one. Yeah, well, we can hey, we can relive that because we're both got a little gray and we're both definitely a lot older. But so, in all seriousness, what could you leave us with? Give us one tip or one short story or whatever you want to get out there. So you leave the people to listen to the Big Water Podcast with that we well, should know about. I think, Tom the, I think the biggest thing is obviously some of the stuff that's recently happened in Lake Erie. We're not going to go into, but you know, fish <laughs> fishing's a great sport. It truly is a great sport. It's the most greatest sport God ever made, in my opinion. And I don't care if you fish for bluegills, you fish for crappies. I don't really care. Just go fishing. And uh, it took me a long time to realize that. But since, you know, the last three years now, I went back to fishing brook trout and fishing steelwood and fishing crappies and fishing bass. And I really enjoy love fishing again. I really, truly do. Where it was starting to be not as much fun. My wife hadn't bought a fishing license for three years because I was too busy doing things in my life. And um, I spend more time fishing my wife now than I ever have. And uh, the last three years has been just awesome to just go fishing again. Well said. Tom, thanks again for joining the Big Water Podcast. Producer Dude, where are we at? Are we on, like, Podcast Something, Stitcher? Podcast Something, yes. Go to Podcast Spotify. Something. What, what are we at? Where, yeah. I don't even know where we're at. Spotify, we are at Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Amazon Podcasts, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast, you'll find us. Or you can find them all at BigWaterFishing.com. And then you can see most of our links and videos and things, obviously, on YouTube at Big Water Fishing, Instagram, Facebook, Big Water Fishing, BigWaterFishing.com, whatever it is. If they can't find us, I don't know. They just Google us, right? But don't Google Tom Keenan because if you do, you're going to find an actor, not the fishing Tom Keenan, my second or third favorite cheesehead. Oh. <laughs> Wait till you hear who is second. I don't even want to know. You don't. We're out until the next episode. Thanks again, Tom, for joining the Big Water Podcast. See you guys. Keep up the good work. <laughs>